Okay, we are recording. I am Brandon Polite, Associate Professor of Philosophy at Knox College in Galesburg, Illinois, and I'm joined by Nathan Wildman, who is Assistant Professor of Philosophy at Tilburg University in the Netherlands. Nathan, thank you so much for joining me. Oh, thank you very much for having me. This is, uh, yeah, something I was looking forward to. Awesome. So we're talking about this thing that you've been working on for quite a while on uh, basically what you call voyeur gaming, which is just watching other people play games. And you and I both contributed to a round table on this topic at Aesthetics for Birds, and I'll put the link to that in the description. Um, but when thinking about the millions upon millions of people who watch other people play games, especially online, uh, you know, in video games in particular, although, you know, they watch, you know, D&D &D and, and poker and other stuff. Uh, just the most basic question is, why would anyone do that, right? The whole point of games is that you play them, that you get, you know, the most out of them by actually playing the game. And so why would anyone merely want to watch other people do the thing that they themselves could and perhaps should be doing? Yeah, I, I mean, I get this a lot when I talk to people about the, the, the hobbies that I have. Um, I think that's a really tough question, actually. There's, there's one really cheap analogy, which is just something like, why, why do people watch sports, right? Um, so I'm a, I'm a big football, oh, soccer, sorry realize my audience. Uh, I'm a big soccer fan. I really support the local uh, Tilburg team, Phillips Bay. They're terrible, but I love them. Uh, I love watching them. I love watching them on, on the screen and everything. Partially that's because I'm just awful at soccer. Um, and I think that kind of gives us at least one maybe justification for wanting to watch people play some of these games is being able to watch genuine skill uh sometimes it's actually watching people be really terrible as well but i think that basically kind of fits in the same thing you know you want to watch someone who's amazing or you watch someone who's just an absolute plotter who has no idea what they're doing and they're completely failing at the game i think those go hand in hand but that's really just kind of one justification i think another one might be something like accessibility um, so I have some uh, physical ailments that make it really hard to play certain kinds of games. I'm not really going to be playing many fast twitch kind of games. So really the only way I can kind of experience some of these things is via Let's Plays or watching them on YouTube. I really, really love Sekiro, but there's no way in the world I'm going to be able to actually like do everything and to be able to see the story all the way through so the closest i can get is to watch one of my buddies play through on twitch or something like that again though just kind of a justification i think a more interesting sort of way of justifying some of these things is by thinking about the kind of let's play or voyeur gaming that's going on so some of them are what i've, I've called elsewhere performances where what you're really after is something like the skill or quality or yeah, the, the actual play, the effort involved, the ability involved. And I think that's that's kind of what's going on when like, okay, I wanna watch a speedrunner or somebody like this. But then there's other times when what I'm really interested in is watching the commentary. Basically like the people who are playing the game are just really funny. And I'm more interested in listening to them. And the game is just kind of something for them to rip off of. So that gives you a different kind of justification. The game is just a means to kind of get you to, you know, the funny people who are talking. Kind of building on that, another one is, is sometimes these things that I've called creations, which actually one of my favorite Let's Plays ever is one of these. And this is where you basically take a gameplay and you use it to create some kind of new work. So my favorite example of this is Chubot's Terrible Secret of Animal Crossing, where he plays through Animal Crossing, generates a kind of screenshot let's play, and uses it to tell a story about this kind of psychotic, child-stealing, animal mask-wearing cult. 
it's a real lovely subversion of the, the kind of loveliness that is Animal Crossing. It's hilarious. Please go read it. It's great. Um, yeah, I think that those are kind of different justifications. So thinking about something like accessibility, thinking about something like display of skill, sometimes just the funny people who are doing it, sometimes the really cool new kind of meta artworks that get generated, all of these can be, I think, good reasons for wanting to engage with what I call voyeur gaming. Put really bluntly though, probably the best reason is it's just fun. Some of it's really hilarious and amazing, but yeah. Okay, cool. So part of what you're saying is, you know, some of the game in terms of accessibility, right? It's the story isn't available to me because I can't do it or I can't play it or I'm not good at it. And so the only way to access the story is to get involved and, and, and you know, the, the commentary, it's funny. Some people make, you know, almost movies out of them. Yeah. And yeah, yeah. And one of the qualities that people often ascribe to video games is their cinematic qualities, right? They're, they're like movies. And it seems like watching people play games is in a sense like watching a, a movie. And so I think, you know, clearly some of it's going to be like that, but and so do you want to talk about that and then talk about how other kinds of, of watching let's plays or, you know, just, just voyeur gaming is not like movie watching. Yeah. I mean, I think so. So one of my favorite let's play pairs, again, Chip Cheesem and General Ironicus, and they've been making let's plays since, they were originally on something awful. They've kind of moved more to YouTube since maybe 2007, 2008. As they got better at editing, um, really maybe their peak is, is, is their Let's Play of Uncharted 2, which is an amazing cinematic game already. And then the way they play through it, so Chip is really good. And he, he goes through barely ever getting hit, barely ever getting shot. It's a really expert play, and he gives you a kind of uncut version where you can listen to the commentary over everything, or a cut version where the commentary is pretty Spartan and it's really just focused on the gameplay. And what you get then is, is in effect, like all told, I think it's about 20 hour, just video of the game. And it's very similar then to kind of pivoting to watching a, a film. Um, What's striking though, and this, this kind of comes back to your initial question is, when you think about watching film, it's, it's not an interactive kind of medium. So by taking a game and turning it into a film, you might think something's lost or certainly been, been changed and modified there. Um, but yeah, I think there, there's a lot of engagement with at least some of the Let's Plays that are very cinematic and very similar to just sitting down and watching. That's certainly what I'm after when I'm like, oh, I've got to eat my lunch in between teaching classes. I'll just fire something up on YouTube. I don't want to have to think about it. I just want to watch somebody play like Fez or something like this. Yeah, yeah, cool. So what are the kinds of, of uh, voyeur gaming that are not like watching movies that you know are more interactive or more engaged actively, I guess? Yeah, so I think I think arguably the one of the very first Let's Plays was was this. So exactly when you want to pin this down is it's kind of hard, but in the I want to say it was two thousand five, um, there was a Let's Play on on the Something Awful forums where oh, I don't even remember who it was anymore. Where one of the forum members played through Oregon Trail, and the kind of idea was okay we're all gonna go it was literally a let us play Oregon Trail and people on the forums could respond to the thread and you know they would name the people who were going on the journey to the west um they would you know would you come to different points the the OP would kind of have a vote say okay are we gonna you know, build a raft and try and float across the river we're we gonna try and find shallow water and every time everyone would vote like forward the river, forward the river, forward the river. So what you really had was, was a kind of sense of the community of people there on something awful, jointly playing this game. We're kind of giving instructions and saying to the OP like, okay, here's, here's what we want to happen. And then they would instance it in the game. 
And this is something that a lot of initial Let's Plays, especially when they were still screenshots of these kinds of, of, of games, really were. It was a let us play. We open them up and then hold votes and, and people on the forums could vote and that would lead then to what happens in the game. And things have kind of pivoted away from that for a while, especially with the shift more towards YouTube, where you have people watching big personalities play these games, often with face cams, kind of freaking out to you know, Five Nights at Freddy's or something. Insert your own example here. But what's kind of cool is, is it's coming back around cycling. So as, as Twitch has, has, has really exploded, you get a lot more of this community aspect here where people are playing. Um, so I was watching a, a stream recently of someone playing Tunic and they were getting really lost. So he kept, he kept turning to the stream and be like, okay, can, can people give me hints? He didn't want them to just like say, okay, dude, go, go here, go do this. But he was like, oh, can someone kind of give me a hint about where to go? And, and that's kind of neat because it's bringing back, it's, it's bringing the viewer in as a kind of secondary player almost, uh, which, is, which is, a, is a very cool kind of fun place to be. It harkens back to like sitting on the couch in the 80s with you know, siblings of friends. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's cool. So Let's Plays, as you said, start off as Let Us Plays, where a one-player game becomes this sort of communal activity where, you know, we're all contributing to the decision-making process that leads to, you know, this many people getting dysentery, this many people drowning in the river, uh, you know, this many buffalo being shot, et cetera, right? <laughs> and, and then, you know, as you said, just historically, it becomes, you know, just sort of this passive watching of these sort of big name personalities, you know, going through the game. But now with, with Twitch, it's become much more interactive. And, and as you said, uh, you know, it's very much like sitting on the couch with this person even though, you know, there may be thousands of other people with you on this, you know, virtual couch, big couch um, but big it's, couch. yeah, it's a, it's a big couch, but it's very similar to, you know, watching, you know, your best friend or your sibling playing, you know, Super Mario 3 or Final Fantasy 7 or whatever. And, you know, there's a sense in which you're there with them, you're, you're, you don't have the controller, and yet you're helping them do the thing that they're doing, you're offering advice. And, you know, being on the couch physically with them means that if they get stuck, they can hand off the controller to you, and you can get them out of whatever thing they're stuck on, which, which is not the case necessarily with, you know, the, the virtual couch of, of the Twitch live stream, you, you know, they can't, the, the streamer can't hand the controller for you, but it is interactive. Yeah, yeah, I think it, it, so that kind of interactivity point really works better to the, the, the sort of Twitch style with, with broadly puzzle-based games or something like mystery games where there's a lot more, less physical reaction and more kind of mental reaction going on. Um, but I guess, I guess maybe just to pick up on something you were saying there, the the sense of being on the couch with them is kind of a double-edged sword so it, it it quickly leads to developing potentially problematic parasocial relations between the the stream watcher and the streamer um, there's a very interesting youtube documentary on this i can send you the link to put in the show notes about the rise of parasocial relationships and how they're really tied with this this kind of feeling of like oh you're really there and you're really interacting with the person and like you're playing together um in some sense yeah but in another sense there is a big gap there that's interesting right so it's it's you know sort of the par parasocial relations it's similar to those that form around celebrities right and it's more the case or at least it was more the case I think with television stars than movie stars because, hey, George Clooney's in my house every week, right? He's in my living room with me. So I know him because of ER, right? Or, you know, going back in time, facts of life or whatever, yeah. right? And, and so there's a sense of intimacy you form with them when really this person's just a stranger, right? And, and how does that manifest itself 
uh, with Twitch streamers or with, with interactive gaming, right? Is it different in kind or different in degree or like what's going on there? I'm not sure if it's different in kind. Well, one, one sense, we'll come back to what I think is a deeper point, but I think there's, there's one shallow sense that's different between the kind of TV actor and a, and a streamer is there isn't anything or often isn't, isn't anything like a script to be performed. The, the Twitch streamer is almost always just kind of talking and doing their thing and riffing and going. There might be some really loose scripted points or maybe they know what's going to happen in the game so they'll have pre, kind of pre-planned responses but that doesn't happen as easily or as often that, that kind of scriptiness. Interestingly that's that's totally different with YouTube Let's Players where there's so much editing and you can control what's happening and things that it is much more directly parallel, I think, to the kind of TV star stuff that you were just talking about. Um, but maybe the, I think that's one point, maybe a, a, a deeper point, again, has to do with the, the amount of interactivity. So no matter how much yelling I want to do with my, you know, the, the characters in the TV show I'm watching, uh, so I always I used to watch a lot of Seinfeld and I, I find it really just it hurts me to see them have these un misunderstandings and miscommunications and I'm like no just just stop for a second and ask him like what do you exactly mean like don't go on with the uh, whereas in it, you know if I'm doing that on Twitch there's a possibility that someone will like oh no no oh I misunderstood there's a a level of 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 that, yeah, interactivity or a level of power in some sense that's in the hands of not just viewers that is missing in these other cases. And I think that that's something, again, that, that can bolster that parasocial connection because you feel like, oh, they they actually talked to me. They, they took my advice. Um, whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, again, thanks on the, on the cases, so. Yeah, yeah, right. It, it's, you know, nothing you do while sitting on your couch is going to affect what Jerry or Elaine do, right? Whereas with a Twitch streamer, there's at least a possibility that, you know, you're not, well, you're not screaming into the void. You're actually screaming at someone who could hear you and pick up on it. And so, yeah, that, that power dynamic is radically different. Um, and, and so your, your sense of empowerment is going to be different and, and the sense of intimacy i think that that would form around it is less false than in the case of intimacy you have with a character on a tv show right or an actor playing a character on a tv show it's no 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 this person's actually there interacting with you right uh yeah yeah um that's interesting and so yeah the community side of it i think is really really interesting right and, and my contribution to the round table on aesthetics for birds is very much on the shared experience of being on a couch or you know either physically or virtually um and the sort of sharedness of the experience and do you have any thoughts on that element of it right just the the value that's added from being a part of something larger than yourself um as opposed to you know just sitting and watching a youtube video uh you know of of an event that happened years ago perhaps that this is a thing that's happening live you're there with other people and you're engaged with each other and with the player yeah i think i think there is something really valuable there to put my cards on the table though i much more prefer the like you know these are these are videos made 12 years ago it doesn't even go past like you know 280p or something like this it's it's terrible quality but that's because of weird nostalgia for a yeah, things that were happening on something awful. Um, I think, well, maybe to dance around the question, I'll give you I'll give you a couple cases that I think are really unique and only come up in these kind of community interactivity cases. And one of them is, it's a game called, well, it's a modification of Mario called One Mind Mario. Um, I think I might have mentioned this to you before, maybe. It's amazing. So what you do is you have multiple people kind of logged in playing the game at the same time. And play switches between different players 
it's a set amount of time. I think it's every five seconds or seven seconds or something like this. So what we need to do is if you and I say we're playing this together, we'd have to basically be in sync with our movements. Otherwise, when it switches, Mario's gonna kind of, uh, and, and you know, all the momentum gets killed, the jump doesn't quite work. That's something that is really amazing to watch. And it's super cool to watch as it happens because you get, you know, the joys of seeing people like, oh, they were slightly off, so fun things happened. And, but also just when it works and when it all clicks and it's just like, oh my God, that was incredible. Um, I haven't been involved in a stream where you're playing. Uh, I, I good friend who was, and he said it's super stressful if you're the player, because <laughs> you never know when it's going to club over to you. So I think that that that's one thing. It's kind of tied to this 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 communal empowerment. Um, another one, an, an even more extreme example of this is Twitch plays Pokemon, um, which took you know, 10,000 years for them to finally beat the game, but they, I think they beat Red, I don't remember which one it was. Um, but this is just for the viewers at home, this is where no one is actually kind of in charge of the game. Just the chat inputs, well, button presses effectively into Pokemon, and then the game just follows the order of the button presses as they come in. And this is again something it's kind of like literally let us all play. Um, and I think at its height, it had something like 8,000 people playing at one time, which of course just leaves, you know, Ash spinning off into nowhere, uh, or Red, sorry, spinning off into nowhere. Um, so I, yeah, I think there's, there's something really unique and interesting there about these. The, the, the kind of community and the interactive tools that allow us to, to play these ways. That didn't really answer your question, but that was what I could think of. <laughs> no, no, that's cool. Um, yeah, the <laughs> poor red spinning off because there's 8,000 inputs happening simultaneously. <laughs> but yeah, the Mario one does sound really stressful. And yet, you know, when, when it goes well, everyone sort of doing the same thing together. And so in a sense, you know, presumably if it's going well and you're like all clicking, uh, you know, clicking in the sense of like on the yeah. safe wavelength, right? Not necessarily doing that, uh, <laughs> but it would involve doing that, right? Uh, it, it would feel like you're playing when someone else is playing, right? Similar to, you know, like giving your little brother a controller that's not plugged in, right? And them thinking that they're playing along with you when really, they're not doing anything right that, that 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 would be that seems really cool like like i'm doing this thing and yet my controller is not plugged in at this particular moment and, and what would be so again this is something that i'd be interesting to see but it's if you if you didn't even know whether you were in fact the one in charge ever right? so you just went through a whole level and it was just a perfectly synced thing but between everyone who was playing at the time that there's something really cool about that and, and this kind of harkens back maybe to um a really well oiled or well done play in in some sport right where everyone's just got the right they, they know exactly where the other people in their team are going to be and they know how their opponents are going to respond and it all just flows perfectly um, yeah, so there, there's something really fabulous about that, I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, what other cool stuff is going on with Voyeur Gaming? Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, I think, I, so one thing that's really taken off in, uh, let's call it the last four or five years, has been what's sometimes called actual plays. So these are recordings of people often playing tabletop role-playing games. So the, you know, the, the big one is, is Critical Role, um, but there are lots and lots of other ones. Um, these often take the form of, ironically, podcasts, <laughs> where uh, you, you just sort of record the audio of a gaming session and just a genuine phenomenon here. And part of it is, I think, connected to people's interest in the, in the stories that are produced or people's interest in the characters that are generated, which 
links, I think, back a little bit to the TV analogy that you were talking about just a second ago. Um, but so for one, one really interesting aspect here is how much it's changed the tabletop role-playing game scene. Dungeons and Dragons, fifth edition. Mm, wasn't really clear how successful that was gonna be, but then a lot of these actual plays started using them and really, really took off. Arguably the reason that fifth ed did so well is because of people like Critical Role and stuff like this. So it's an interesting kind of case where something like voyeur gaming for tabletop really impacted the gaming industry do you think uh, on that point do you think that games are now being made specifically to be let's played or streamed or you know podcasted it, you know i think you know tina win is is talked or at least i think talked and also i think written about how uh food has become much more you know the visual has become much more important than the actual flavor and taste sure. because of Instagram, right? That the products are being tailored to the visual medium medium when they're supposed to be gustatory um, or, you know, whatever, right? And, and is something similar happen, happening with games and with video games, right? Where certain elements are maybe being lost because they're being created for, you know, streaming or for Let's Plays? I'm not sure if I would say lost. I would, uh, I'm not sure I would say lost, but there's certainly been a change in emphasis in some games. And um, so my, my favorite example of this, there was an interview with the guys who made Octodad, which is an amazingly silly, great game. Um, and one of the reasons why they made it the way they did is because they really were hoping that it would be easy for people to make let's plays up to make this warrior gaming stuff because it's the kind of silly thing where you get people laughing and and the colors are right and and yeah they were very forthright about we, we've made the game a certain kind of way because we want people to stream it we want people to to come show it off and of course you have hardware right so i think the ps5 comes with a share button i think that the the God, I forget it every time. What's the, the most recent Nintendo handheld? Or not handheld. Uh, the Switch. Yeah, the Switch. So it doesn't, this, the Switch, I think, has a, has a built-in share function as well. Um, but that might be, that might be wrong. Um, but I think there's lots of, lots of instances of, of hardware developers, including these kinds of things, because it's a huge industry. I mean, the, the gaming industry in and of itself is bigger than music and movies put together. And there's a lot of free advertising, effectively, <laughs> often really, really amazing advertising out there going with this while you're gaming stuff. Another kind of fun example we had so the, the, the aesthetics for birds discussion that we had was actually reviewed by uh, someone who does philosophy on stream. Um, so this is philosophy roulette. Uh, I think it's Noah Greenberg. I forget, I forget his name, but he he reads philosophy papers online and, and kind of live comments on them and, and effectively does something like what a lot of us do when we read articles. And it was very fascinating to watch him do that to the exchange that we had because it was someone who's very much immersed in something like voyeur gaming, voyeur philosophizing in this case, thinking about how the stuff we were talking about comes back around to what he does. And he talked about developing a particular form of Minecraft. No, sorry, not Minecraft, Minesweeper, <laughs> to go real old school, where you get people like, to make it easier to stream and you could have tournaments with it and stuff like this. So I think there's a lot of people who are developing games specifically to make it easier for people to kind of do this voyeur gaming stuff. That's awesome. And, and interestingly on the voyeur philosophy thing, like, like thinking about early philosophy, so much of it was just Socrates's students, right? Quote unquote, following him around, just watching him, you know, 
uh, do his thing on, on these people, right? And just sort of, you know, not necessarily engaged themselves, but just, you know, not engaging in the discussion themselves so much as just, let's watch Socrates do this thing, right? Nearly all of the dialogues, we can presume there are, you know, 20, you know, young men and boys, you know, hanging out, watching Socrates tear down people. <laughs> and yet, you know, now we're back to, to that, you know, uh, online, not just in the classroom. <laughs> yeah, so I, I think the in, the people who say that indeed Socrates, those are the first fanboys. That's really what you're getting at. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, cool. Is there anything else you want to talk about with with this topic? No, I mean, I think this is something that I'm genuinely incredibly passionate and interested in. I think there's a bunch of very cool things to think about from, from the philosophical angle, from a kind of sociology angle. And it's, yeah, I guess basically the only thing is just, I hope that people are kind of keen and interested and wanna think and talk about it more. Um, that's it really. <laughs> Awesome. Well, well, I agree with you. And uh, Nathan, thanks so much for joining me and for, you know, putting together the the panel at the ASA that led to the roundtable. <laughs> yeah, thank, thanks for having me, man. Yeah, great. awesome. Keep doing what you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try. <laughs> cool. Thanks. <laughs>